Hello, I am Cody Allingham and this is the Transformation of Value podcast. Now today we talk with Hanos Belia. Hanos is the founder of The Altruist, which is a dedicated Bitcoin education and community space based in the Auckland CBD. Now a friend of mine actually sent me a photo of this and said, Cody, you need to check this out. And I reached out to Hanos and I thought, wow, this is incredible. Uh, I didn't believe that we actually had a dedicated Bitcoin space in New Zealand, but Hanos has done a really great job setting this up um, and putting himself out there. And I think really the story over the last year has been about more and more Bitcoiners meeting in real life, uh, interacting with each other, building those connections um, and helping strengthen um, the Bitcoin community in New Zealand. Uh, so I think this is a really great uh, project uh, and a thing that I think we can all get behind. Uh, I talked with Hanoz about his uh, motivations to start in the space, some of the work that he's doing there um, and some of his thoughts around the future of Bitcoin in New Zealand. So it was really a great chat. I do hope you enjoy the episode. If you'd like to support the show, please consider streaming some sats via your favorite podcasting 2.0 platform. Otherwise, on to the show. Uh, <laughs> trying to justify to people why, why I've got like facial bruising. <laughs> but, That's not um, meant to happen at jujitsu usually? No, nah, no, it was a loose <laughs> leg um, from, yeah, I, I don't even know what it was, but I think it might have been a foot or something, just kind of like, you know, flying around. So um, uh, it's good though, um, kind of keeps it real. But uh, yeah. how you been anyway, man? Pretty good, pretty good. Yeah, the um, just been waiting for the sun to come out over here. It's been all raining, as you probably know, but um, today's looking all right. Starting to come together. Did your um, uh, did your school, your the, the ultras, did they get affected by the flooding at all? Fortunately, not. Everything seems to be all right at the moment. Yeah, yeah. I've got a pretty, I've got a apartment building above me, so there is people living there. So I think they would prioritize keeping it in decent enough condition so they can all continue their lives yeah that's phenomenal yeah, nice so, nice right in the city center as well so um the, i think the drainage and all that is pretty in good condition yeah last time i was in auckland that uh, that area on albert street uh, is nearby where i think they're building the new train station right a little bit further along from that yeah well i'm i'm actually basically right right in front of that where that construction's happening at the moment across from the high court, which I did hear had some issues, the high court building with some of the flooding um, on the other side, but yeah. I'm sure they'll get that sorted. No, 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 that's all good. But look, my my sort of uh, discovery of the altruist and your Bitcoin school in Auckland really stemmed from a friend of mine sent me some photos. He was walking down Albert Street in the central, central city of Auckland and he sent some photos. He's like, Cody, check this out. And I saw some like Bitcoin logos and some really cool merchandise and stuff through the door. I think it was closed on that day, but my, my buddy just sent me some photos. And then I, I checked it out on Google Maps, had a look around. And I thought, man, this is amazing. This must be the first dedicated Bitcoin space in New Zealand. And I hadn't even heard about it until now. Um, it's really exciting. I mean, how, how did it all start? Where did, where did the idea for the altruist come from? Should we give that friend a shout out first? Do you think he'd like that? Yeah, yeah, I'm, uh, Ian, Ian knows who he is, but... Um, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, wonder if, I wonder if he's been in yet. Um, but yeah, no, so basically for me, it was, it was that exact process. It was like once I'd figured everything out about Bitcoin or as much as I thought was kind of the main parts of it, I felt like, wait, why isn't there somewhere in our country where people can go and learn about it in person? And I felt like it was about time that something like that was around for people who were maybe a little bit uncomfortable learning online um, and they needed something like that. And then at the same time, just to be there and to show um, the community that it is real. It's not just on your screens and be in their faces on their way to work every day and just in their daily lives like that. Mm. Yeah. How long has, has the altruist been around for? So I opened up the place in August of last year, 2022. And um, since then, just been building it up slowly with more content, more products and different sort of ways to encourage people to participate in the network and that sort of thing. Um, increasing the, the, the education side of it too with um, what, what we present and that sort of thing. 
Um, but yeah, re really just as and when I have the funds to add more to it than just putting that in um, and growing the space. I really like so, that. Would you, how would you describe it though? Like, would you describe it as a, an educational space, a community space for Bitcoin? Like what, or is it all of these things? Like how, how do you frame it for people? Yeah, it's, it's funny because I actually, I find myself using different terms for it as well because I haven't um, pinned down any one particular thing as of yet. So I've interchangeably sort of used like school, um, educational institute. Sometimes I use the word museum for Bitcoin almost as well because it's basically just a room with everything around you on all four walls of just Bitcoin related things. So, um, and at the same time, it's free to enter and look at. So well, essentially it's kind of, You've got the books and stuff as well and kind of that yeah. side of things. Yeah. yeah. If people want to get away with some more information, do some reading of their own, or even if it just means that they take a photo of them and go away and purchase them on Amazon, really just increases that education. And then, yeah, I mean, you could even use the word, it, it might be a bit like, I don't know, a bit weird, but you could even use the word church of Bitcoin if you wanted to, because it's like, yeah, it's like that we don't know who Satoshi is after all. And I've created a space um, just basically which talks about what he's written and what he's created. So well, it's, I mean, it kind of is like that. Yeah, I mean, it's ultimately a, a, a secular thing. You know, anyone can come in and appreciate it, I think. You know, so I mean, may, maybe church isn't quite the right word, but it's a, it's a space where people can come together. And that's the beautiful thing about Bitcoin is that it doesn't really matter what your um, – your beliefs are in any sense politically or, or or anything like that it's it's money for everyone ultimately and that's one of the beautiful things about it and i think there's things within it that everyone can find value from so um in that sense mm. it, it is really a, a, a community building um thing um which which is really cool and you also sell some merchandise there as well like bitcoin related um items yeah um i wanted to keep the education like the anchor point of it and what we're primarily about but then um, and keep that free, of course, because I didn't want to charge people for sharing information, which they can get elsewhere online if they were to dig dig into it themselves. But, but basically, if they have a valuable experience and feel like they learned something and want to give back to the upkeep of the place, then there are some products that they can um, purchase just to support us in that way. Just hoodies, T-shirts, books, like you said, stickers, um, just general sort of things like that. I, re I really like it. I, yeah. I can see um, just on the video you're, you're wearing a, the Altruist t-shirt. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I love it. How, how did you come up with the name, by the way? The Altruist School of Bitcoin. Like, where did that come from? I I went through I went through a few different ideas, um, and they all were sort of just making me laugh a little bit. And I just I thought I thought they were funny in different ways. And then I got stuck on this one because I was kind of just talking to my parents about how i wanted to keep the um keep keep it free in a sense like i didn't want to charge people for that education and then but at the same time i was thinking about how like satoshi had chosen to give it to us um in that way and take on all the risk on himself by creating this as, as you can imagine there was probably and there probably still is for whoever they are like a lot of risk associated with doing this process from governments and all these sorts of entities but um so he was the altruist in that sense and then i'm kind of just adding on to that by providing the space um to the community i i really like that it's it's something that i've talked to um you know other people about is this way that bitcoin thinking changes you and the the altruism that you you you, you, you just said like I, I really feel that is something that you can feel from bitcoin like it it is it's part of the, the kind of the culture and it, and it's funny because it's on paper it's supposed to be the opposite right it's supposed to be incentives align it's greed it's it's these things that mean that the system hardens and is um able to overcome any attack but at the same time because of the fundamental principles of the way it works with sound money it, it promotes, I think, a certain kind of human goodness to emerge, which in the fiat world is extinguished and is, you know, it doesn't, it's not a successful way to operate. And so the ability of doing things like value for value 
where you you know someone provides you value and you, you you're able to compensate them by sending some sats that just doesn't really work you know in in the fair world especially online whereas in the bitcoin space it's like a lot of it is open source a lot of it is uh that kind of altruistic development um in, in many different ways but it, it always kind of comes back and it, it seems like it's it's a very um a very cohesive ecosystem very um yeah it sort of it, it, it self reinforces through that process yeah i think like a lot of other things um this its strengths and its weaknesses kind of tend to be the same in a way like um you'll hear people generally say like it's used by criminals um and if you really think about that what that really means is that it's basically available for anyone to use because criminals at the end of the day are just people um and that just means this the system is available and open to everyone and it doesn't discriminate in that way so although it might be seen as a weakness that criminals can use it it also means that anyone who has access to these the basic requirements needed to get on board can use it um at the same time similar to obviously like cash previously which also criminals to use so yeah i mean what i what i love about being able to have longer conversations like this as well is i mean really being able to dive into what you mean by that because i think the knee jerk reaction kind of clutching the pearls is that oh it's going to be used by bad people but really the uh, things get used in all sorts of ways and by having a label for someone to be say someone's a criminal what is what does that mean because we maybe have an idea in our mind of, of what a criminal is but a criminal can also be someone who's simply not happy with the way the government's doing something um and it the way the world is kind of heading is increasingly towards this surveillance state, this um, every facet of our life being broadcast to centralized government systems and, and all of that stuff, which we've seen kind of increasingly over the last few years. And so all you kind of need to do at this point is say the wrong thing and you're, you're on the wrong side of it and you can have your bank accounts shut down, you can have your ability to do anything shut down. And so there's this kind of argument that's like, well, who what do you do in a situation like that you're you're pretty much stuck and you're locked out of of doing anything if you can't if you don't have a bank account for example yet that's exactly where we're heading um and bitcoin simply provides a way around that um unencumbered by the opinions of increasingly totalitarian governments globally Mm. which which Mm. sounds a bit heavy (laughs) yeah well it's no you're right because in, especially in, in terms of like trade, which we're talking about really, is that there is two sides to every transaction and, and whatever transaction it is that we think of as an example, um, who really is the criminal, right? If it's, if it's like the drug dealer, there's someone purchasing the drugs. Um, if it's someone selling a weapon, it's someone buying a weapon, you know? So in, in a sense, both of these people uh, can be seen as criminals, but at the end of the day, it comes down to each individual and their values and where they draw the line on different things. Um, and if, for example, like I was to be buying um, cannabis with cash right now, and and that's what I think is should be okay, then even when Bitcoin is to become a legal tender. I might choose to buy cannabis with Bitcoin, even though at that time it's still illegal, but may not choose to do other things which are illegal because that's where I draw my lines in a sense. So, Well, it's, it's I mean, it's, it's entering into, I think, a larger conversation, which is what is our relationship to the state? And this is kind of the meta argument of our day. And I believe this is the really the biggest question that we're facing right now, where over the last few years, the government has really made itself known into every facet of our lives and at the point where they at their discretion can legislate anything to be whatever they need it to be and sort of the the breakdown of that democratic process where there's a push and pull you know it's it's sort of like well we're just going to go ahead and do this anyway despite the fact that the public aren't really for it and so that creates i think a situation like 
or pretty much the the genesis of Bitcoin emerged from that era. But we're just seeing that increasingly today, where you know there's just so much out there that um, you kind of end up self censoring yourself. You don't you know you don't say stuff publicly. And I know for certain that these conversations with you and I are having now, a year or two ago, I would have been more reluctant to do it because I'm like, well, it's it seems like it's not okay to talk about these things, but I feel like that is a situation where the world starts turning into a much worse place when you can't have free and open discourse about ideas um, and at least just talk about it, you know? Mm. Yeah, uh, I think there's a lot there's a lot on that side of it. Um, I don't I don't personally use the premises to get into anything like political as such um, on any of it because it's such a wider subject and and I'm not I'm not unhappy with the government or anything like that personally for me it's more so um, like the primary thing about it is the limitation um, and scarcity aspect that it provides and I'm in a way curious about what the world was like in the past with the money that was limited or backed by something that was limited like gold um and what our society would look like on something like that again with bitcoin because we've had a period of about 50 odd years now where it's basically been creating through like human emotions like so people sitting in a room deciding how the rest of society feels and based on current events and they decide if they want to create more or create less of the money. Um, but that, that in itself provides a lot of unpredictability to, to the society and people can't plan for their futures accordingly. But if you have something limited, um, you can kind of use that to plan for your future. Another idea that I've been mulling over recently as well is I feel that our perception of human interaction right uh human action human interaction is but we've been under a fiat standard for so long mm. that we just assume that this is natural right the way that we engage with each other but i often wonder if under a hard money standard a, you know a so-called gold standard or bitcoin standard how that at large would change the way people interact and i think there's a lot of nihilism a lot of increasing social unrest in the world a lot of just um, apathy, all of these quite negative sentiments. But is there a situation where you, you know, where where everything looks a little bit hopeful for the future, that people tend to be better people? And so what I mean by that is, you know, say uh, after after the war, you know, there's this kind of period of rebuild, and so there was this period of trauma followed by a period of rebuild and kind of hope. And so despite the poverty and the kind of the real the real world challenges that that society might experience say after world war one or world war two this desire or this hope to rebuild in a place like japan after the war really felt like there was a certain kind of optimism to it and i feel like today if you talk to anyone young or, or anyone really they're like their desire for the future their dreams of the future are, are pretty pessimistic you know overall i think most people are pretty skeptical that we're even going to be around in two years um with the wars and everything going on and i often wonder whether if we had a hard money standard that you knew that you could kind of rely on that there was this future that you could build towards for yourself and for your family that that would actually mean that people generally are going to do the better thing and the right thing and that starts to nullify some of these arguments that well it's going to be used by bad people and bad things are going to happen like i, f I feel like there's a bit of there's always going to be a bell curve of people who are doing the right thing yes. and the, the so-called wrong thing but well, in, a, in a system, I guess what I'm saying, in, an, in a system where the incentives are to get as much fiat as you can, to accumulate as many assets as you can, and to game the system in that way, it kind of just promotes a certain mutation of, of the human spirit, which, coming back to the altruist and the name and like what Satoshi did, it's kind of like, well, we have an opportunity to kind of break free from that and return to a certain kind of justice and righteousness. Um which I think is innate in all humans, but we just have forgotten, perhaps. Yeah, it's a good point what you're saying about um, young people, and I think about it a lot in, in the sense that if 
if you think about someone who's sort of coming out of university now or finishing high school or something like that, and they're thinking about where they're where they are on the ladder compared to a lot of other people in society, like um, who, are, let's say, for example, are running tech companies and things like that. Um, I just I wonder how they feel about that and how they can kind of catch up and find their place because. As we know, our current system is based a lot around credit and what assets you have, you, you tend to borrow against them. You, you don't really spend the money that you have, even if you are wealthy. So, so for them, it's like they don't have any assets as of yet and they don't have any money. So they're almost doubly behind everybody else. Um, mm. and, and trying to think about catching up to that becomes so much harder. Where at the same time the goalposts are moving as well. Like if they do want to get an asset coming out of university, they're thinking, okay, a house price is this much, but by the time they finish their degree, it'll be that much more. Um, so, so they can't really compute those things and makes it a little bit more difficult. Yeah, I absolutely agree, and I feel like that idea that the goalposts are moving and that it's just getting harder and harder, and you just have to look at something like the housing market which is like man it's it's like it's it's a joke at this point you know like it's, you know you got to come up with $900,000 for for a house you know a state house a former state house and and it's you know an hour's drive away from the from the middle of town like it's just so far from reality but people have just kind of put up with it um and that means it's like yeah you you start to lose hope and it also means there's a certain kind of sacrifice that's made and so people in their 20s for example like getting out of university instead of going and exploring the world or doing what they should be doing they think well i really need to pay off this student loan and save uh you know two hundred thousand dollars for a deposit on a house which means no holidays no nothing forever and then you kind of get to it and it's like this promised thing isn't even there you know and, and maybe the housing market flops who knows what's going to happen but it's this like financialization of of everything that maybe not for you know, like for teenagers but certainly for adults coming out of university it's like the first thing it is like, oh, i've got to get a job and sure that that that's that's a i guess a, an upright thing to do but there's also this period i think of exploration and kind of self-development that is really important at that age um and you lose a lot when you when you take that away and it also means people are sort of like, well, I, I need to just get the stable thing. I'm not going to take a risk and do this thing, which is really my calling. I'm just going to yeah. follow. And so you have have a very narrow, I don't know, the options start to narrow perhaps in aggregate. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can give a perfect example um, as myself to kind of explain the inequality of it is that like my parents are fortunate enough to have a couple of properties themselves and because of that in my situation i'm lucky that they can sort of borrow against those and use their mortgage um, and provide me with funds to do whatever i want to do um, whereas me being myself i can't do those things because i don't have those properties but if you think about someone else who doesn't have um, their parents don't have those advantages in that situation um, it becomes unfair to them in that sense, right? Because I then have more opportunities compared to them just because um, my parents can use assets um, as funding, which which is kind of done commonly around the world, as we and, know. And and I think the, the important thing to underline there is there's obviously always a distribution of wealth, right? And that's unavoidable. And I, I think we can all agree that that's just the natural order of of, of human systems but the real inequality here is that because of these interest rates these kind of artificially suppressed interest rates over the last little while it's kind of really served a first in first served kind of uh, system where if you, once you've got it you've got it and you're good to go and anyone else coming in after you the ladder gets pulled up they're not able to get onto it and that i mean you'll be familiar with the cantillon effect and how the people who are closer to the money printer, the people who have the assets are always going to be better off than the people who've got cash, right? Um, cash as in just money sitting there. And so saving money in your bank account is a complete waste of time at this point in the game. But the alternative to that is even if you've got someone who's in quite, you know, 
quite a poor situation if their money is growing at just the same rate as anyone else's um, and that that is the best place for the money to be you know it's not more effective to put it into housing or into the stock market if cash money in the savings account is the place to put the money everyone's money is growing at the same rate it mm. changes the game a little bit and so you can be you know and when i've traveled you know you've got people you know driving taxis in bangkok or whatever and that, that, that someone like that being able to just put away a little bit even if it's tiny compared to what someone would expect say in new zealand or in another country it still is is on the road to good like it, it's something they can work towards but when it's like it's not even worth saving it's not even worth giving it a go because you're not even going to be able to get on the ladder at all that's where i think there's negative social things come in a bit like you might as well just not even play the game at that point yeah um, yeah the the it's it's kind of like the association of um, money with time and um on a day-to-day -day basis we think that nothing is really happening but when you when you look at it over that long term you kind of realize like how much is changing and that sort of thing yeah yeah no it's i mean it was funny for me the other day i was walking along and i found like a i don't know if you remember the five cent coins you know <laughs> from the old days with the little tuatara on them and i was like man they used to be able to buy like a couple of lollies with that you know like and now it's yeah. not even like, we don't even yeah. have it anymore it's like but it's so slow and so glacial that no, most people don't notice it amongst the vibrations of the daily life it sort of takes a bit of a back seat and then one day you wake up and you're like, man, what has happened? Um, yeah. And it, sound, it sounds like, it sounds crazy, but I think a majority of the population don't actually know that the money isn't backed by anything. Like if you kind of ask them and dug into it and they wouldn't know that like in the 70s we came off that gold standard and and what the process is now like i heard you talking in one of your previous podcasts about um like the bishops um of central banking and like it's it's funny because this this in new zealand for example it's just a group of seven people who make a decision on our monetary policy and those are like seven unelected people they're not politicians as such but they're chosen by politicians so yeah. they're deciding on how we're feeling at that time. Um, and as we know, for, at least from the past few years, humans aren't perfect and even they make mistakes. So that can lead us down some awkward paths. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's interesting because I walk past the Reserve Bank every day. It's up on, I think it's number one, the terrace, but it's right at the corner of the terrace in, in Wellington. And I walk past there and you look at it and it's like, it's just this old building, you know, and it's, mm -hmm. you see that in the morning, you see the people going in, you know, got their caf their coffees in their hand, you know, just sort of, it is a fallible human institution. And in, in a way, it's more obvious than say something like the Fed in the US where it's a little bit more impenetrable. It's like, man, th this is it, th like the entirety of it is here. And I've walked past there at night and they left the lights on and I could kind of like, you could kind of see in and you can see their desks and you can see their messy tables the paperwork they got lying around and the stupid things I've got written on the whiteboard. It, like it's literally right there. And mm. you realize it's like, man, I I would take Satoshi and the code of Bitcoin and the protocol any day of the week over this human institution, which ultimately is uh, I mean it's it's like a, a amateur amateur hour, you know, like it's not even that well run, I don't think. Like they they have you know economists working for them and, and and they've got all of this kind of busy work but it's like look your your mandate for um you know what the reserve bank is about really is a simple mathematical equation and it's all of the the fluff that goes around it and the kind of the smoke and mirrors is what is what leads to having 12 floors of people or whatever it is um and the kind of dissemination of that and that, and that's sort of like the, that's where the bishops of fiat thing kind of came from it's like we, we we're waiting for the white smoke to emerge from the yeah. from the tower to tell us what the ocr is going to be um or the inflation you know how we're going to deal with inflation i, I think i think as well for them it's unfortunate because they get caught up a lot in the like the here and the now and um and then we get decisions about the current environment but 
it would be nice to know what's going to be happening for like the next 10 years and and it not be changing like as we know in 2020 like the rates went down and they there was no indication that they were then going to jump hugely back up in the in the next couple of years but that's what's transpired so um how are we meant to plan for that without knowing for it so everyone's in this sort of state of limbo uh, and it's really painful because you get people now who are hocking themselves up and back in 2020 2021 you know they were like well you know rates are low i'm gonna lock in a home loan and get on the ladder finally and then now we're starting to see the rates go up and those first home buyers just normal people uh, are now underwater and that's kind of like the lie has revealed itself and I mean, perhaps in a long, in a roundabout way, this is as good for Bitcoin as all things are, where the pain and that of going through that process is going to help educate people that look this this way of operating is not sustainable. This is not going to continue to work. Yeah, well, and that's the beauty of it is it's like its linkage to time in itself is is amazing. Like we've got those three sort of associations with time, with which keep it in line really like i don't know if you listen how how much your listeners know about this but like the one block being the 10 minutes and then you've got your halving every two hundred and ten thousand blocks um so that means that's going to happen every four years if the if the block stays on 10 minutes and the block does stay on 10 minutes because of the difficulty adjustment which happens every 206 2016 blocks i believe it is so it's like those three kind of linkages with time itself keep it completely predictable into that future. And, and that's why it's like a plan for the next 120 years. We can know exactly what's going to happen to the system itself. I mean, humans might react to it in different ways throughout that time, but the network itself is going to play its role. Yeah. I mean, that's something that's really interested me as well is this idea that finally we have a measure like a, an actual way to measure things and that is the, the i mean we've, we've got the, the kind of the tick tock of of the blocks going but we've also got a, suddenly a measure for the world's energy and kind of value i guess and I, I, that this is quite a big one to really take on board but the you know there, there's not currently anything for measuring the world's economic output i think you can use dollars if you really want to but because it's an elastic thing it doesn't you know it's, it's measuring it's like a it's like having a ruler that's stretchy it doesn't actually work um yeah. whereas I, I often wonder whether the the development of bitcoin could almost be similar to the development of the metric system and how the meter was a defined distance i believe it was from paris to the north pole was like divided by a certain number that was the the meter which led to a lot of developments and the ability to build machinery uh, you know pr coming into the enlightenment and the industrial revolution you suddenly had um, refinements of of units and i mean you still had the imperial measurements as well but the ability to have rulers and and you know fine uh, fine uh, units of measurement uh, enabled the development of steam engines and precision machine machines you know lathes and, and and these kind of things which were then able to be used to make even more accurate machines and that was kind of you know the role the the runaway of the industrial revolution whereas prior to that you know units were very ambiguous you know a day was a day but maybe they didn't have clocks they didn't have hours they didn't have minutes and seconds and all of these things the second the minute um, the hour the kilogram these units ushered in just a new wave of human um, human development through the industrial revolution and now we have you know we're going from the dollar which is like what does that even mean? It's it's like a ambiguous thing to look. Here is the unit, and there's 21 million, and all things can be divided by that, and measured in that unit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've, I've thought about how, like, if for example, like aliens were to come onto Earth, right, and and they see that we as a species can't even agree on one tradable currency, it's like it's kind of pathetic in a way, isn't it? That we're just all on this one rock and we've all got these different sort of forms of paper couldn't we agree on one thing to just trade and then we can move things anywhere in the world without having to rely on one country's decision making for the entire world and 
And of course, there's the unfair advantages that they gain from having that one currency. Yeah. And the, the kilogram doesn't change depending on what country you go. I mean, the Americans are the only outlier, but that's a, a temporary aberration of history. But the kilogram, the meter, they, they are yeah. absolute units and they don't change you know, every every two months or every three months, they don't change depending on where you go. They are they are absolute. And I agree, like value, the measure of value, I mean, that's probably the most important one. And we still don't quite have, well, we do, we have it now, but it hasn't disseminated yet. Um, it's, yeah, it's an interesting thought. Um, yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a big one for me to kind of, for people who, who come into the ultra space is kind of just make sure they they leave with that one part about uh the satoshis in the bitcoin as well because it's it's really surprising how many people don't know what that unit of account is or how many there are and just just so they know once you tell them that there's a hundred million of them in one bitcoin and each of those is essentially a tradable unit I think that's a really important factor for them to know so they can do their own thinking with that um, and come up with their own sort of ideas of how that would work. Um, diving into that a little bit, um, I'd be interested to know a little bit more about your approach to talking to people who don't know much about Bitcoin. And so you're able to divide a Bitcoin into 100 million sets and you don't have to buy the whole thing. You can just buy a little bit of, you know, maybe, you know, 50,000 sets or whatever. And that granularity is something that, as you say, people might might not be aware of. But what other really key takeaways do you think are important when you're trying to share the Bitcoin story with people and, and kind of educate them? Yeah. The first thing is definitely getting out whatever that they may have heard about Bitcoin um, just out of their heads first and clarifying what of that is correct and what's not and just kind of clearing those things up. And then from there, we can sort of start plugging the gaps. Um, but yeah, so on the on the wall, what I have is kind of a separation of the three aspects of money, like you've got your unit of account, store of value, and medium of exchange, and just defining how Bitcoin fits into all of those um, for our system. So because if they can go away with that, then essentially they can kind of start doing their own thinking about in terms of their lives and how they see society, what would be the impacts of having a type of money like that and how it would work. So making sure they know the 100 million um, Satoshis in one Bitcoin and then that there's going to be the 21 million. So that leads into the sort of store of value part and how that uh, halving is going to happen every four years, which is going to increase the circulation um, throughout time until we reach that 21 million and kind of pointing out where we are in that timeline at the moment. Um, and then, of course, just pointing out the medium of exchange side, which is uh, the transactions happening in 10-minute blocks um, and how those take place on their wallet and things like that. And just the fact that we have been in this for about 14 years now, um, over 5,000 days and the average transaction time across the network in that time is something like nine and a half minutes. So it's a very accurate process that's been created um, over a long period of time. It's pretty, pretty compelling. Do you, th do you think it's important to educate people about, um, well, well first, so two things, do you think it's important to educate people about things like uh, layer two lightning that sort of thing and then do you also think it's important for people to get their hands on some bitcoin and to start engaging with it um instead of making it theoretical actually saying look you know here's here's some sats you know here's an invoice try paying it that sort of thing what are your thoughts on that um i, I do think lightning is really important but i think it can be scary for people um especially if it's that first step on the ladder um trying to understand that too but I think if they have that first interaction with Bitcoin um, and maybe they purchase some on the main chain and hold on to that for a while uh, and look at how that moves through time, then they can kind of, within maybe six months or so, they might be ready to kind of start understanding Lightning then at that point and make a move on to that. But like you said uh, about the second part about getting some Bitcoin, 
I do get the question often, as you can imagine, like, oh, how much should I buy or when is a good time to buy? But obviously, it it's very different for everyone because everyone's value of money at the moment is different depending on how much they have. But I think a really simple way of just um, defining that and making sure it's applicable to everyone is if you take if you just take all the sets that there are going to be in the world, which is like the 100 million times the 21 million, and that's all that can ever be in the system. And you just divide that by what we now know is 8 billion people in the world as of a few months ago. Um, you get something like 260,000 sets, which it, it's a really simple calculation that anyone can do at any given point in time. And it kind of links back to what we were talking about um, about the goalpost moving and that sort of thing in our current system is that um, with Bitcoin, you know that if you have your slice of the pie, which is that many Satoshis, then you're kind of on that average. You're sitting on that line of average, or if you have more than that, you're above and so on. But basically just pointing out that if you purchase th that amount, then you basically have your share of the network. And then from there, whatever happens happens but at the at this current point in time that amount is only worth something like fifty dollars so yeah. the worst that can take place is it goes from 50 to zero and the best that can happen is who knows what so well, yeah i like it fifty dollars yeah that i mean that makes sense and that's like a good i think a good amount to get started with um uh it means if you were to buy it on the base chain you know um it's you're not going to lose too much to transaction fees or anything like that. Um, that that's a really cool idea. I mean, the other idea that someone mentioned to me was the idea of the Satoshi Millionaire as well. So um, mm. a little bit more than that, but you know, thinking in the in that sense of you know getting um, getting a million sats, which is it should be achievable for most people if they put a little bit away. Um, it's it's definitely not unachievable, um, and it's sort of promotes people to start once they hold it it's no longer about whether it's a good idea or not it's about learning more um yeah and i think that's often the barrier to entry and i've found it myself talking to people it's like they're very reluctant to even engage with it and at that point it's kind of like well you can't really you can lead a horse to water but you can't make it drink and so it's like you either have a wallet and you're you're self-custodying some bitcoin or you're not and if you're not then I, no matter how much i try and convince you it's still there's a kind of quite a huge gap but i think once you've got it and you've seen the transaction happen there's something quite primal about that where it fires off some synapses and neurons and you think well actually wow you just sent me that well i just brought this bitcoin and it it works it actually works you know i think that can be quite a powerful thing to witness um for the first time certainly yeah definitely I, I wish i could experience that again for the first time i think i remember it being pretty cool but yeah i think a lot of people have kind of made a decision in their head because of how long it's been around now and everything that they might have heard about it at the time that uh, it's just not for me and like no matter what I'm just I'm going to steer clear of it because they've kind of just drawn that line in their head and for those people it's maybe just not going to happen but I definitely feel like at this current moment it's probably more irresponsible to not purchase any than it is to purchase like a hundred bucks worth or something just for security's sake yeah and i think that's why i really respect what you're doing with your your bitcoin space in auckland the altruist like having that available as somewhere people can go to discuss these ideas it, it just it, it it feels like it's the right time for it and and i feel like these things are happening uh, i always think in terms of hyper local and hyper global that's sort of my two frames of reference for bitcoin and like hyper globally um you've seen like bitcoin park and you know bitcoin beach and all these locations where there's kind of communities forming around bitcoin um but then hyper locally it's like well we have one in auckland now um and that certainly wasn't the case i think a couple of years ago and i think there was still reluctance and, and even for myself you know I, I never really sort of talked about it um i didn't put myself out there Whereas pretty much as of this year, I've said, look, you know, let's let's put it out there. Let's have these conversations in the open with people like yourself who are building and creating, um, you know, within the ecosystem. And I think that that's helping bring more people into the world as well. Like, you know, people sort of through a friend of a friend or through family, they start to become aware that, yeah, this, this is a thing, you know, and you can continue to ignore it. I feel like there's still time for people to ignore it. 
you know, you don't need it really just yet. You can kind of sit on the fence. But there is going to come a time when you're going to have to get in. Um, and what we're hoping is that by that point, everyone that, you know, that we care about, people who have taken the opportunity to share their knowledge uh, with people who haven't got, you know, they don't understand Bitcoin. By that point, they, they have learnt what it means and why it's important. Um, and who knows? I mean, maybe that's only a year away. Maybe that's 10 years away. But it's that's, I think, where the altruism comes in as well. It's like taking the time to talk to someone about this um, mm. because we care, it, which sounds a bit funny, but it's actually what it's about, right? Yeah, no, you're spot on because I knew that starting this it wasn't going to be like a profitable business or anything and that's not why I did it because if I wanted that, there was a hundred other things I could have done. But I feel like I know um, that this thing is going to happen on a global kind of stage and there's not a lot like Auckland as, a, as itself or New Zealand can really do about it if it happens globally. So I felt that it was important to make sure locally people had the had like some opportunity to learn about it and like what you said about just why it's important and what it means even more so than buying any because for the people who are against it it's it's like do you know why you're against it can i just explain to you how it actually works and then even if you don't purchase any at least you have a good sound understanding of what it is before you um talk down on it yeah yeah. absolutely and i think also that's one of the challenges because it's a decentralized project ultimately we are facing relatively centralized fud and counter arguments and so i I mean it's it, it, it it comes and goes but it's quite easy for people to take their opinion from the mainstream media and say okay well this is obviously a bad thing clearly though that they're not telling the truth and that's I think the cat's out of the bag for most people that there's an agenda going on there, but I think a lot of people still have a, a bit of a, an innate trust for these legacy institutions, and it, that's hard to deprogram that. Like you, you, you can you can try and you can try, and it still can you're not really getting through to people. And I, I think that's that presents a real challenge because Bitcoin is decentralized. You hear about it from a friend or a family member, whereas the centralization of the, the, the anti-Bitcoin narrative, which is coming through your television, through the internet, through, you know, your news websites, that's, that's a lot more aligned. Like, I feel like they, they have, they've got their, cent- you know, their, their talking points. And then your friend who's into Bitcoin, they've got their talking points. It's like, well, who do you trust? I, I think that can be very confusing and it's understandable and it's forgivable for people to not, you know, to be wary of that, you know, like... Yeah it's just innate skepticism and that, that, that's that's fine like that's that's verified don't trust you know yeah even for me before i kind of had jumped into starting to learn about it at all i could kind of tell that there was a narrative already at play and this was already about like 10 years into bitcoin's life that everything you read about it was heavily like using negative connotations attached to it and not very factual in a sense because I wasn't able to get any correct information, but more so just ag- aggressive commentary around it. So, um, and that was yeah. a big part of why I opened this place was to make sure people are just really getting the facts and then they can go from there and make their own decision about it. But at least they have that information. I like that. I really like that approach. Um, uh, Hanos, like having, having the ability to, provide the facts and the information and then people and this is where bitcoin thinking comes in it's like verify don't trust right you you can go and do your research like look check just download bitcoin core download the node you can go and verify for yourself you know satoshi here's the genesis block blah 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 like it's <laughs> it's it's all there on and and that i think that that's where the thinking kind of comes through right and so you providing a space where people can come in and learn about that is, is really important and to your point about the the narrative i think that's also and there's an increasing awareness i think that there is an agenda to the way things are spoken about in the mainstream media and the being able to read that is almost a skill like being able to read a headline and feel and understand the narrative that they're trying to carve which if you're just taking it like raw you're like oh well, that's the truth it's like no you you really have to start questioning what truth they're trying to push and that's i think an acquired skill and 
unfortunately a lot of people aren't able to do that like they 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 just see it and and accept it at face value whereas i think perhaps what we might see with younger generations actually coming up is that naturally because of everything that's kind of increasing over the last few years they've got more of a an ability to read that perhaps i I don't know but being able to entertain different truths at the same time yeah i think it's about like picking out words that aren't necessary in a headline or in an article and there's someone's opinion rather than the actual information get rid Um, of the adjectives eh? just yeah them out (laughs) and especially in this context it's really important because this what we're talking about is essentially math and that's what money should be at the end of the day it should be like two ledgers just going up and down there shouldn't really be something in between moving that and um and that's why i also i personally feel like the price um of of bitcoin should be it's like the last metric we should be using because that's really just our um as humans impact on it and our perception of it because when the price was at sixty thousand, and when the price is at twenty thousand, it's the exact same product that the network's offering you're still getting one of the same thing but you're paying forty thousand dollars less for it so it's just how you perceive it at that very moment in time and what the network has chosen to do is just produce those blocks every 10 minutes and if it continues to do that it's doing its job and everything else is just our perception yeah. so we need to yeah. just make sure that that the blocks are printing and then the rest is the rest is fine really yeah i, I love it so just diving into um i guess your role in this and with the altruist like how, what where do you see bitcoin in new zealand in say five years what like what what do you imagine well what do you see um the landscape being for bitcoin in new zealand um do you yeah do you feel we might be on a bitcoin standard by that point like get, share your thoughts on, on on that please i think the first thing we need to do is uh create a what they call like a de minimis amount that you can spend without having to create a taxable event um and i personally feel like this is might be like the number one obstacle um that's stopping us moving forward for individuals and for businesses because at this current point in time if i was to buy something from a business in bitcoin all together for me and the business, there's going to be four separate taxable events. Um, so there's like the GST, there's the income tax, and then the business is going to pay uh, a capital gains tax on the Bitcoin, which we know takes place. Um, and if they're a business, they're going to have to do that because everything's open. And then for the person, the person making the transaction, there's that capital gains tax for the Bitcoin that they sold. So there's all four of those. And, if I just wanted to go out and buy a dinner with it, I don't want to have to do that. And it's just incentivizing me to spend the Bitcoin. If I know that I have to go home and put it into an Excel file to, to keep track of those sorts of things. So if people can openly go and make simple transactions, like I would say under $200, so you can go out and buy dinner, you can buy a pair of jeans or, whatever it may be, something simple like that, um, then that would be a huge step in getting more people to want to accept it and um, kind of removing that obstacle. Like I, I think um, I could be wrong, but I understand that in Australia, it's like the first $10,000 that you spend are not taxable, um, whereas in New Zealand, it's from the first dollar. So we're a long way away from that i'm wondering just with the australian thing though is that the first ten thousand earned i'm just thinking for the or is that also for spending is that the de minimis amount uh i think it's like the first ten thousand that you like sell of your bitcoin potentially i could okay. be wrong but um no, it'd be good to investigate that because um, I, yeah. I know certainly there's been a lot of argument that new zealand should have a zero to fourteen thousand or so income should just be zero rated tax i think at the moment you pay the tax and then it later comes back to you through benefits if that's your level of income um 
which was kind of like uh, a big push that uh, certain people were talking about. But so I really like this though, the de minimis of, uh, amount, which I, I believe there was in the US, there was talk about having a, having a similar thing, right? Where you, um, any amount spent below that capital gains doesn't apply. Um, yeah, yeah. They've put forward a bill for that, a couple of the senators for that, but um, it hasn't been pushed through as of yet because there's a lot of, it's a lot of back and forth with those sorts of things. But, okay, so uh, if I'm correct here, so that sort of talking about the future of Bitcoin in New Zealand, you feel like that's kind of this legislative route is one of the real big um, opportunities or, or, or areas where uh, attention is required? Well, there's a lot of um, like underlying sort of stress for someone to transact in it because they feel like, well, if they don't do that, handle that tax if they do purchase something then they are technically considered a criminal right because they're not following the procedure so if we can take that emotion out of it then people might be a little bit more likely to make those smaller transactions and once they've participated in that way then who knows where we might go from there yeah i think that's something that interests me a lot you know being based in wellington and kind of knowing how these people kind of think you know people who work in the government and I can see in a real opportunity because it's a small place, really, that we can educate, um, you know, ministers, politicians about these things. Because I feel like almost, you know, if if you were able to do a forty-five minute session with 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 a minister at the altruist and you walk them through it, I feel like that would do so much better than any of the advisory they're currently getting, which seems like a lot of it is kind of crypto you know DeFi type stuff which it's a bit of a smokescreen for the truth which is bitcoin itself right and so i don't know i mean that's just another great thing about you running this space and 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 that i respect is that you 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 could probably you know you could make that happen um and you could say look you know this is lightning this is how it works this is how payments will work but you know the real challenge is because uh, the capital gains this isn't going to be useful right now um but if we could have a de minimis amount then anyone could use this and New Zealand could become a leader with this technology, just like we led with FPOS. Um, New Zealand was like mm-hmm. one of the first countries uh, to do FPOS. Yeah. 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 So that, that would be one way I would say to make like smaller transactions easier to use. And then potentially another way might be that we choose, we do it geographically. Like for example, if we were to say, let's say in Queenstown, we make, um, we make Queenstown a location where people can, um, spend Bitcoin without any capital gain. So the business doesn't need to worry about that. The individual doesn't. So people are kind of going on holiday and they can do this fun way of transacting in a new way. And we can use that as kind of like a sample for the rest of the country and see how something like that works. Um, And then people who have, who own Bitcoin all over the country might go down to Queenstown um, and participate in the economy just because they want to, be a part of this event in a way and um, yeah. all the businesses are kind of working together on how they can make it easier for their customers and that sort of thing i really really like that that it's kind that, of like el salvador or something really isn't yeah. it it's like small locations it's like a little test queenstown works really well i think as well because it's a small place it's a destination for um high net worth individuals for tourists for everyone right um its economy is driven a lot by that um, tourism sector which and because New Zealand is a s- relatively small country and the government is quite accessible um, you know the uh, I, I could imagine a situation where you know it's, it's not layers and layers of bureaucracy like it's, it, there's still going to be a, a, a bit of red tape to get something like this over the line but kind of a Bitcoin beach type situation mm. and I know yeah. c- certainly um, Rob and a few others from the Accept Bitcoin project are really you know the, in Queenstown that they've got you know more and more people on board you know there's a couple of restaurants and bars and stuff now accepting bitcoin i think there's more than there is in wellington um perhaps even more than auckland um just because of the work they're doing and because it's that small community they're able to kind of get a network effect going um and so i I really love that idea of like a a zone where you can you can spend bitcoin and, and it all just works as a pilot program and it's kind of what new zealand needs as well i mean tourism took a big hit during the whole lockdown period and I don't know, I mean, it's starting to bounce back, but, you know, what, what what's the attraction? I mean, if you can capture, 
if you can make something really special, you know, go to Queenstown, but you can also do this Bitcoin thing. I mean, that would be amazing. Could you imagine like marketing that like actually properly um, yeah. on the international stage? You've got this like the most one of the most beautiful places in the world where people love to come from all over the world and they can spend this currency that they've acquired over time and um, yeah. and really spend it in a way that is going to benefit them at the end of the day. Um, yeah. And it's un very unlikely we're going to see see it used for sort of detrimental activity down there. It's just going to be for personal kind of enjoyment so i think it could be a really fun way of doing it um yeah i really yeah we'll see yeah no i really like that and i think that, that that's where i start to think well man this these are things that we need to start working towards and and what you're doing uh, and what many other people in new zealand are starting to do it's like we're, we're building a foundation to be able to launch this because it's because it's decentralized it's hard because it's not like one company saying let's do this in queenstown it's like multiple individuals multiple companies multiple people trying to organize things which is kind of ultimately it's a bit slower than it would be if it was centralized but it's more robust i feel um and yeah yeah, yeah i mean just going back to what you said about like having ministers and in, in there and talking to them about it um what, one of the things that really kind of got me pushed in the direction of wanting to educate more people was the um, inquiry into crypto assets that the government um, undertook in 2021. So this was in August 2021, where they asked the public for their opinion on crypto assets, basically, the good, the bad and the ugly, everyone could say whatever they wanted. Um, and we have as of yet not received the results of that. So there was a couple of uh, professionals who wrote a report based on all, everyone's opinions. Um, I did get the chance to speak to one of them uh, and they've submitted their report at the end of last year. However, the team who's running that from Parliament side has as of yet not done anything. We're, that's more than a year and a half ago and now we're receiving another um, inquiry essentially from the Reserve Bank talking about how we feel about these things so before we've even received the results of the last one so it is moving pretty slowly and not yeah. with a lot of action yeah. which can be kind of frustrating but that was a big part of why i wanted to just be there and kind of help to push that yeah. along no that's really quite cool. I, I i know i'm aware of the um uh the, the thing you're talking about the reserve bank um was it request for submissions on it was on cryptocurrency crypto assets and now it's also like CBDCs and new forms of private money, which is kind of the the whole other side of it, which yeah. is like, well, what are they going to do next? Um, yeah. that, so that so. first that first one was um, from Parliament itself about just crypto assets, and now the new ones from Reserve Bank about mm. future of money, which includes, as you say, um, CBDCs and everything else. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Um, well, look, I think that's. Um, and it's really good i think you you are really well spoken and like having i think a voice that's coming at it from that sort of holistic angle is, is very important so um i'm interested with with the altruist and the space you've you've got there i mean how can people find out more like what's what's the best way to connect with you um to to, to come to the space i mean like where, where what it was the address can people just walk in like tell, tell us a bit about that yeah, so the absolute best way is definitely just to come in and feel it for yourself. Um, we're at 74 Albert Street in the city, right across from the uh, district court. In Auckland, and yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I'm there pretty much Wednesday to Saturday uh, for people to come in, discuss things, see the space, that sort of thing. But if you're not in Auckland, you can um, give us a follow on the, the Instagram page where we post a few different things and things like that. Um yeah so that it's instagram just increasing yeah. that conversation the instagram is the the altruist school right that's right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and I'll, I'll link it in, in the show notes but um i actually i i really love your instagram by the way i think it um you're doing a bit of a scavenger hunt you got some sets hidden around the city right um yeah in certain places um is that you got like a qr code sort of hid, hidden somewhere or how's that working well, um actually so it's kind of a twofold thing. The first part of it was to kind of just increase the awareness and the marketing for the space um, and gain some followers that way. And the other side of it is just to teach people how private keys work, because what I'm doing is putting 
the private keys on on the token which are, which is being hidden um, and then they can find that and use those keys to upload it into a wallet themselves so in a sense kind of figure out how that works for themselves as well yeah that's really cool yeah. i mean learning you're learning the fundamentals through and, and it's a bit of fun right it's um yeah and just engaging people and getting them to get out and about into the city and that sort of thing yeah is there um is there anything that you need or anything that you're after to help enable your your work with the space um a bit more like is there anything from the community that you think would really help in terms of a collaboration or i guess yeah any, anything like that um so at the moment the next sort of project i'm trying to get up and running is a website for the space just so i can um lead lead more people to it through through like seo and that sort of thing so i'm personally not a developer myself or anything like that but um if someone was interested in helping me create a website and get that up and running it would be awesome okay um, well you, you happen to be talking to a web designer so um <laughs> amongst other things i wear many hats but um we will take that talk offline and uh we'll talk about Absolutely. a website for you um uh, but look i'm really i'm really excited and as i said when um when my friend ian sent me these photos of your space i thought this is amazing i've got to chat to uh, hanos and and learn more about the space but yeah I, I'll, I'll post the details in in the show notes and hopefully send a few people your way um hopefully we can catch up and do an in-person talk uh, either in auckland or in wellington um and um, hopefully just continue these discussions but yeah really uh, respect the work you're doing and uh, I think it's great absolutely thanks so much for having me it's been a pleasure no thank you alright see you later take care